context of salvation, in the context of salvation, no human being can substitute for another person. In the context of salvation, no human being can substitute for another human being, for another person. And this is found all over in the Bible. Clear message, the clear messages of the Bible is that no one, no one person can substitute another person, another human being. And I can prove it to you, friends, from, from the, the um, Psalms 49 verse 7, from, from the Psalm. And this is 49, ver 49 and verse 7. Clearly the Bible says, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. So clearly, no, uh, no, one, no one can substitute another person in the context of salvation. Ezekiel chapter 14, and you can read also verses 16 and 20, but just for you to see what the Bible says in general on this topic of substitution, in verse 14 says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, and you know who they were, were in it, they would deliver only, no one else, only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Again, no other, no one individual, no one human being can substitute for another person in the plan of salvation. This also is found in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 24, 20 through 24. Let me just read verse 20. Ezekiel 18, verse 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the, the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. It doesn't say that you can share that righteousness with others. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Friends, no one person can substitute another person in salvation. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, in the New Testament, we also find the same concept, the same teaching then. And this is now um, Peter preaching to thousands. And then after sharing the gospel with them, the question that was brought to Peter was, what should we do? What shall we do here? And Peter said to them, repent. You, 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 and you individually, repent. How do we know it's individually? Because later, later it will say, and let Every one of you, every one of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for re the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every one of you. So no one person, friends, listen to me, no one person can substitute for another, another person, for another creature. But what about the verse that we just read? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 29. How do we understand 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 29? Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 29 seems to be saying that a person that passed away, a beloved person that passed away can be replaced by you if you baptize when the person is dead. This teaching is known as baptism for the dead. Is that possible? Can that happen? Is that how we are to understand this passage? Before we get into the passage, friends, before we get into the text, I want to suggest to you, friends, that every time we want to come up with an understanding of a passage, we need to always consider the implications. What is it that we are to consider, friends? The implications. The implications. What if is this way? Where does that, does that understanding, uh, where would that understanding take me? That's something that we will always consider. So consider this, if this text is to be understood the way it's written, the way we see it, and this is New King James Version, by the way, then baptism for the dead, you have to see it, introduces a dangerous concept. Let me help you, let me help you. The dangerous concept will be that salvation can come from your own or someone else's works and not through Jesus. If you can be baptized for a person that passed, that is dead, then salvation can be accomplished through what you have done for that person. But how many of you know that Jesus is the only way? Just two of you. Okay, that's good. That's good. You will, you will join me soon. You will join me soon. 
Friends, we need to see the implications. If, if baptism for the dead is an option, as that verse seems to be suggesting, seems to be suggesting, baptism for the dead deceives us, I want you to consider this, into thinking that we may have a second chance for salvation after we die. Right, if, if, if somebody else can take my place and be baptized for me, there, uh, thus me being saved, then I can just go out and live a wicked life and talk to my son, my daughter, and say, don't forget that when I pass, you have to baptize, you have to get baptized for me. You understand the implications, friends? This is serious. Th this idea of, of baptizing for the dead also places our salvation into the hands of another human being. And not solely into the hands of Jesus Christ, which is the only one, the only way for us to be saved according to the Bible. Because the Bible says, listen to me, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, and praise God that the, the verse doesn't end there. This is Romans 6.23. It doesn't only say that the wages of sin is death. It also says that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, you have to praise the name of God that your salvation doesn't depend on, the, on your neighbor, your son, your daughter, your cousin, your aunt. Your salvation is found in the precious, wounded hands of Jesus Christ. So we can only receive salvation through the gift of Jesus. Nothing but Christ can provide salvation. Nothing but Christ. But what do we do with that? Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? It clearly says so. If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? There are two ways to understand these friends, but we have to always keep in our minds that when we work a passage in the Bible, we have to always consider what is before and what is after. How is that called? Context. We always have to consider the context of the passage because the passage has to resonate with what is before and what is before after. It has to go in harmony with everything that the Bible talks about that subject. You still with me, friends? If you're still here, say, I'm here. All right, you're still here. You're still here. So I'm going to give you two solutions for this. Solution number one is a simple solution. What kind of solution is this? It's, a, it's a, just a simple solution. And this, this, to solve this problem that we find in this verse, uh, or the issue that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, we can simply work with punctuation. Do you guys know what punctuation is? Do you know that a comma can, can change totally the idea of a sentence that you want to express? Do you know that a question mark can simply change totally what you're trying to say? You with me, friends? Only bread. So let me give you an example to the rest of you guys. Listen to this. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how punctuation actually makes a big deal in, when, you write, when it comes to writing, which is the form that we find the Word of God, that we have received the Word of God. Pun, punctuation. Listen to this, this example. There is a, uh, before we read it, there is a cannibalistic difference between these two examples. What kind of difference? Cannibalistic. You know what, what a, a cannibal is? Let me give you the example. You will understand when I send you. I show you the example. Let me see the, the next one. The only difference between sentence number one and sentence number two is a comma. Just a little tiny symbol. And do you see the difference? Let's eat, grandma. Now, uh, check the difference. Let's eat, comma, grandma. Which one makes sense? Punctuation makes a big difference when you want to express ideas in a written form. I, I, I tend to irritate my wife Vivian sometimes. No, no, wait, wait. Most of the times, most of the times. I, 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 I tend to irritate her, right? There will be two ways that I can approach that after I, I simply repent and reconsider what I said. I can come to her and say, I'm sorry, I love you. Let's see the next one. I'm sorry, I love you. Right? Now, listen to this using punctuation. I'm sorry, comma, I love you. Do you see the difference? 
To say that I'm sorry that I love my wife would be to a dense sentence to me. But comma makes a big difference. You see with me, friends? Punctuation is very, very important. Punctuation is very important. The next example will be disgusting if it is the way um, without the punctuation. Let, look it up. Let, let's, let's show it. I find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog. Without comma. I find inspiration in cooking my family and my dog. What? Now let's use the comma and you will see the difference. I find inspiration in cooking, comma, my family, comma, and my dog. Does that make sense? Much more sense. Comma, and any punctuation actually changes the whole idea of the understanding of the message written for you and for me. You still with me, friends? Let me give you one more example. The last one. This is, this is very important and very common also. A woman without her man is nothing. How many of you lady, ladies uh, resonate with that concept? A woman without her man is nothing. How many of you? None? Vivian, at least Vivian? No? A woman without her man is nothing. Let, let's use punctuation now and you will see the difference. A woman, Colin, without her, comma, man is nothing. How many of you men resonate with that? Man. <laughs> Mr. Fred, you just got married. You better raise your hand. So punctuation is, is the, the, the one way to solve this issue. Punctuation. So what will happen with our text again? If we, if we change and how, how come... How come, what gives us the, 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 uh, the authority to change or to, to work with punctuation in this text? Friends, the New Testament was written in Greek. But in, in, in such language, there, has no, there is no punctuation. So when the, the translators came to the text, the original text, they tried to harmonize that text with the context. And so they used comma, they used exclamation mark, they used question mark. So that they will express the same idea that the context is trying to say. But do you see the, the danger there? Because sometimes you can put a comma where the comma is not supposed to go. You with me? Right? So let's, let me just propose if we do just changes in the punctuation. Not in the message, not in the words, but in the punctuation to see how will, that will look like. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? This is the original comma. The original in the New King James Version. If the dead do not rise at all, uh, question mark, right? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Here is the proposed one. Otherwise, comma, what will they do who are baptized, question mark, for the dead, comma, if the dead do not rise at all, comma, why then are they baptized, question mark, for the dead? Do you see, do you see the difference between these two? Just changing the punctuation changes the whole idea and teaching of the passage. Let me put it, let me just do a face off for you, friends, so you can see the difference in punctuation between these two um, ways. The one before, please. Otherwise, and you see the, here, on, on your left, you will see the one that is in the New King James Version or most of the translations. Number two is just making some changes of punctuation, and you see how the whole idea changes. We are not talking in the new punctuation any longer about being baptized for the dead. As simple as that. Does that harmonize us with the context? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Because you cannot take the place of somebody else. Only Jesus is the substitute. Right? Okay, but since, since some of you say, yeah, but punctuation, you can put it here, you can put it there, you can play with that. How can? And that is why we would dedicate some time to do a more serious ex exegetical work here. You ready, friends? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, seems to be suggesting that baptism for the dead has biblical foundation, has a biblical foundation. It does not have a biblical foundation. What if then we can work with punctuation in 1 Corinthians 15 and 29 and have this. What if? Well, first off, you have to know, friends, that every letter written by Paul was a letter addressing a, pro a local church problem. Local church problem. 
Pastor Paul will write a letter because he knew there were something going on in his local church, a church that he funded that he needed to address. You with me, friends? What is the problem here? What is the problem in the church in Corinth? The problem is found in 1 Corinthians, described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12, uh, how this verse states the problem that was happening at the church in Corinth. Paul says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Can you detect the problem? The problem is that people were teaching, people were thinking, people thought and taught that there was no resurrection. So the whole chapter 15 is about Paul telling, if there is no resurrection as you teach, as you believe, then Jesus didn't resurrect. And if Jesus didn't resurrect, in vain we believe. That's how serious it is. Right, so the problem is that some of you are, are believing that there is no resurrection. And Paul writes the, whole, writes the whole chapter to prove there is resurrection. And that resurrection is secured in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, the text says, baptism for the dead. That's what the text says. So we are, we are trying to work the text now. Number one, we need to be sure that we understand what baptism is. And we have to think about that. And I want to take you to uh, a simple definition of baptism that we, we gave during our, our study entitled One Baptism. You can find that in the different platforms on the internet. One Baptism. One Baptism. This is how we defined uh, what baptism was. Baptism is a public, personal, and external act that expresses a private, individual, and internal commitment. If you agree with that definition, can you say amen? So when we think about baptism and we find baptism in 1 Corinthians 15, we find the word baptizo that we already, in the Greek, baptizo, we already know that it has to be with immersion, right? Immersion, submersion, to be immersed in water. That's what baptizo means. And that's what baptism, every time we find it in the English translation, will also mean. But friends, do you know that baptism by immersion in water is not the only meaning of that word in the Bible? There is at least another meaning for the word baptism that is not even close to coming to a place like this and submerging somebody completely into the water. Let me prove it to you. I want to give you three texts for you to corroborate what we're saying here. Matthew chapter 28, verses 22 and 23. Mark chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. I'm just going to read for you Mark 10 and verse 38 and 39. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 20, verses 22 and 23 talk about the same event. These are James and, and, um, and his brother John coming with their mother to ask Jesus about a very particular petition. That was, I want this my son to be on this my sons to be on your right and on your left. And this is what Jesus answers to the mother. Listen, verse 38 and 39. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I, th that I drink and be baptized? Do you see the word there? And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. They said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I'm baptized with, with you will be baptized. Now, you have to think about the time that Jesus is telling this to the disciples. Jesus was baptized in the beginning, by immersion, in the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of his ministry. Somebody. In the beginning. Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his ministry. Now we are not in the beginning. We are in the middle of his ministry. Why is Jesus talking about baptism if he was already baptized? Because he's talking about a different kind of baptism. That it doesn't have to do that is not related to being baptized 
by immersion in water. There is a second meaning for the word baptism in the Bible. And that second meaning is that not only means that you are baptized by immersion in water, but also that you are baptized by immersion in danger. Let me, let me show you another text for this. Listen, we're starting about baptism. What is this baptism? Luke chapter 12 and verse 50. Luke chapter 12, verse 50. Jesus again talking about baptism. Listen, friends, Jesus says, but I, I have a baptism to be baptized. To be baptized? I thought he was already baptized. What is he referring to if it's not something different from that first baptism? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how distressed, a baptism that causes distress, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you see it, friends? There is a baptism by immersion in water, and there is a baptism by immersion in danger. It's a different kind of baptism. So baptism in the Bible, here is the point, friends. Baptism in the Bible has two meanings. By immersion, number one, and number two, and risk of death or jeopardy of life for the gospel. Jesus was teaching them about that baptism because he was going to the cross. He was going to die. And so when you preach the gospel, listen to me, friends. When you preach the gospel, there is a big possibility that you might be persecuted. When you preach the gospel, there is a huge, there is a huge probability that you might be killed. When you shine in this dark world, when you shine in this dark world, there are good odds that you might irritate this world. And because you irritate the world, they will come after you. So the baptism that Jesus is referring to, the second meaning of baptism, is that, is that you, by getting into this, by getting baptized in this way, you actually jeopardize your own life, your own existence. For the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. So keep the definition of the other definition of baptism in your, in your mind as we work the text. Now check this out, friends. Check this out. Number one, baptism is not always by immersion. It's also always in reference to the danger, to the jeopardy that you can go through when you are a preacher of the gospel. How many of you here in this place are preachers of the gospel? How many? You know what, friends? Every single hand should have gone up. Because every one of us, every one of us, once you have accepted Jesus, you become a preacher of the gospel. Some of us preach it behind a pulpit. Some of us preach it behind a desk. Some of us preach it on the phone. Through a magazine, through a desk, through a CD, through a, a flash memory, through a Bible study. There are different ways. Some of us preach it through loving. Some of us preach it by example. There are different ways, but bottom line, each person that has accepted Jesus as their Savior is a preacher of the gospel. Let me ask again, how many preachers of the gospel are here in the house? Amen. 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 So if you are a preacher of the gospel, you are jeopardizing your own life for the sake of the gospel. But how many of you know that if we lose our life for Jesus, we actually gain life? How many of you know, friends, that I prefer to be thrown in, the, uh, in prison for the sake of my Jesus than be living in great mansions with Jesus not being in my heart? And so, first, two meanings of baptism. Keep that in your mind. Number two, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 15, verse 29 now says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise of all, why then are they baptized for the dead? So three times this dead word comes up, and the word does mean that means somebody that is without dead, without life. But let me tell you something. Do you know that the word dead in the Bible not only describes physical death? It also describes spiritual death. Spiritual death. 
there are at least then two meanings of the word dead in the Bible. Number one, physical dead. Number two, physical, a spiritual dead rather. Let me give you two verses for that, two passages for that. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. The same Apostle Paul, he describes what to be dead a spiritual means. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Is this talking about being physically dead or spiritually dead? Spiritually. Thank you very much. Another passage that talks about that, the spiritually dead, is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 5. And you, he made alive. That means that they were dead. They were dead before, right? So far. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. They were not dead physically. They were dead spiritually. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The Bible, every time the Bible talks about salvation, our sins, our trespasses, that which separated us from God is always part of the conversation too. So when you are a preacher of the gospel and you preach the gospel to everyone you come in contact with, be ready to always also talk about sins and how to get rid of them because no one that is hanging on their sins will make it to the eternal kingdom. And so people need to hear that God is not only, uh, that our, our God, Jesus Christ, is not only a savior. He's also a protector. He's not only a protector. He's, always, he's also a provider. He rescued us from our mess, but he also provides power for us to be away from that mess because he doesn't want you to continue being there. So every time you preach this to the people around you, they, your life might be in jeopardy. And so Ephesians 2, 1 and 5 also talks about the second meaning of dead. Dead means in the Bible physically dead or spiritually dead. But let's see, let's see what else. Keep, keep accumulating this information. And then we will see how is this verse to be understood. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29. Again, why would they, they, do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Two times the reference to they who are being baptized. The question here would be what, friends? Who are they, Right? How do we answer that question? Somebody? Who? Huh? Context, right? Context. When you, talk, when you use this pronoun, it's because you have already mentioned names or ident identification of whoever you were talking about or writing about. You with me? So who are they? Who are they? And we know that these they that are being described here are those who are in risk or jeopardy. Who are they? Let me, let me show you the context. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 30 through 32. And this is, again, Paul writing the same chapter. And why do we? Paul says we. Who is he talking about? Is he including himself, yes or no? So whoever he is talking about here, when he says we, is, is Paul and people like Paul. What is the main thing that Paul did? He was a preacher. He was a preacher of the gospel. So what were those, the rest that he say, including in his group? Preachers of the gospels, disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of the only true living God. Why do we, those who preach the gospel, stand in jeopardy? Does the context tell us that the word baptized or baptism is also in reference to jeopardy? Yes or no? It says it right here. And we do we stand in jeopardy every hour. Listen, I affirm, Paul says, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ, Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. There is nothing that we are to work for. There is nothing that we are to hope for. There is nothing here. Let's just have a wicked life. And he says, we. So who are they there? They are those who work with him. 
for the gospel. Those that are jeopardizing their lives for the gospel. Those that are at risk of, uh, at risk of death for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You still with me, church? One more point. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. What would they do who are baptized? For the dead, if the dead do not rise at all. Why then are dead baptized for the dead? So we know that baptism not only means to be immersed in water, but also means to risk, you, risk your life for the gospel. Put your life in jeopardy for the gospel. That's what the context says in, in verse 30 when it says, And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour in the rest of the Bible? All this is in harmony. Friends, we need to understand that this is clear. And I want you to know and so that when, when tribulation comes, I want you to know so when trials come, I want you to know so when temptation comes to your life, you will know that these things can happen to you because you are a preacher of the gospel. And the Bible says that your own children might come against you. The Bible says that your own parents can come up after you. Friends, but when that happens, how many of you know that there is someone that is walking next to us, ready to protect us, ready to fight for us, because the battle is His, it's not ours. But there is a risk. There is a risk. And Paul knew about that. Paul knew so much about that. And let, me, let me illustrate with, with his own life in, 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 um, in Acts chapter 19. Paul comes to Ephesus. And Ephesus was a pagan city, a pagan town. There were many gods there that they worshipped to because it was very, um, um, a very Greek mentality. So they had different gods that they adored and that they worshipped. Paul comes to Ephesus and he starts preaching the only living God. And by that suggesting that there is no more gods. The problem was that at this city... People will make money out of idolatry. There were silversmiths who will work putting together nice looking statues. And when they did that, they will sell those a good price. So when Paul comes and preaches against that, the business is down. It's broke. It's just simply dropped. And so they didn't like that. So all the silversmiths in the, in the town came together and they took all the courage that they had and all the wrath that they had alone and they were looking for Paul to kill him. They didn't find Paul. They found two of his disciples and then they were looking for Paul. And, and this was so serious that some of the disciples came to Paul and said, Paul, don't go there because they want to kill you. See, friends, when you preach Jesus... When you preach the light to this dark world, you might be risking your life. But this is God's message. That when you lose your life for the gospel, you actually obtain your life for eternity. Because you are not alone when you preach. God says, I'm going to send you, but I'm going to also send you with protection. I'm going to also send you with power. You're not alone. So preach. So tell the world, because they need to know there is a soon coming king who is coming for them too. They need to know. They need to know. But you need to know, dear friend, that you might be putting your life in jeopardy. You might be putting your life in jeopardy. And by the way, that was Diana, the one, the goddess that I was talking about. But we moved from there. So Paul, Paul is the one that wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 to, through 12. And he says, we are hard pressed on every side. We, the, the disciples of Jesus, are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who are alive are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in a mortal flesh. So then, 
Death is working in us, but life in you. Friends, when you preach to your friends, when you preach to your family, to your co-workers, to anyone you come in touch with, you bring a life to them, regardless of the death that you might, you might uh, receive because of what you're doing. But the Lord wants you to focus not on what you can receive in this temporary life, but what He's going to give you in the eternal life. What will they do? Who are baptized for the dead? 1 Corinthians 15, 29. If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Is this suggesting baptism for the dead? No, friends. And you know what? This is the only passage that talks about this in the Bible. You never do. Listen to me, friends. You never come up with a doctrine out of one verse in the Bible. That's not safe. Every teaching, every doctrine has to come from the whole Bible. Not just one passage. It's very dangerous to make out a teaching only out of one passage. Let me tell you, let me show you how this is to be understood then. This is my, my suggestion on 1 Corinthians 15 and 29. Otherwise, the yellow ones are the explanation. of The, the words in yellow are the explanation. Otherwise, why will they... Who are they? Gospel preachers. Do who are baptized. What does baptized mean? Risk it. For the dead. In what? In sin. If the dead do not rise at all. Meaning no resurrection. Which is the problem that Paul was trying to tackle. Why then are they baptized for the dead? It's not talking about taking the place of somebody else that already passed. It's talking about telling everyone about Jesus. The life of this world this is not a crazy idea friends i want to tell you that i'm not alone on this because nestles which is a translation of of the greek one of the most modern translations of the greek um uh, the 20 i'm going to use the 20th century edition of, of the greek new testament translates this in this way listen to this translation it says otherwise why what will those who uh, those uh can see that those who are being baptized, join the dead, who believe in the resurrection, it actually dead persons are not raised. Why then are they being baptized? In order to be like those dead who believe in resurrection. So that's, that's the translation. There is a, another way to see this, friends, and he's never talking about somebody living, taking this place of sub, or substituting the one that is already dead. Because such a thing is not possible. Why? Because the Bible says that the dead know how much. Nothing. That means they don't hate. They don't love. They don't accept. They don't reject. They cannot make decisions anymore. So their destiny is already figured out. Before they die. Conclusion. Conclusion. The Bible teaches, Hebrews 9, 27, that it, is, that, it, that it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, Hebrews chapter 9, 27 says, the judgment. So there is no more opportunity, friends. If, if you want to decide for Jesus, today is the day. If you want to give your life to Jesus, today is the, light, the day. It's not tomorrow. Is not after you're dead because there are no more opportunities. Now is the day of salvation, friends. So once a person dies, they are judged based on the life they lived and their acceptance of Christ. That's it. There is no option for another person's works or baptize or uh, works to be baptized to take their place. And Paul say, assures this in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, when he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. When? When you are alive. The main point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is resurrection. The main subject in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is resurrection. Paul is trying to convince his audience, you and I also, that Jesus resurrected. 
And because Jesus resurrected, if death reaches your door, you can be assured that Jesus, when he comes back, he will say, Brett, wake up. Jesus, when he comes back, he will say, Amanda, if Amanda, if Amanda passed away before Jesus came back, Jesus will say, Amanda, my dear daughter, come out. Let's go home. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. How do we know that we are going to be resurrected? The Bible simply states, because Jesus resurrected. Because Jesus resurrected. Friends, it, it will be so absurd if we preachers of the gospel, we preach the gospel if the dead does not resurrect. If the dead don't resurrect, then why will we spend all this time preaching, preaching the gospel? The Bible teaches that, that physical dead are asleep. That's what the Bible teaches. And that also matches the other reality that a person can't baptize for the unconscious dead. Because that unconscious dead now should have accepted Jesus before when he was in here and she was alive. Baptism, friends, as we learn, is by immersion. It's a personal event. You need to know, you need to believe what you have been taught. But all your life you renounced it and, re and rebel against them, that and then you, when you're dead, you are going to be baptized by another person on behalf of another person? No. Friends, the greatest reality found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that through Christ, we achieve victory over death. We are not to be afraid of death. We are not to be running away from death, friends. We have to do all that is in our hands to, to have the best health possible and so that we will live the longest we can so that we can preach more to the world. But if death does come to our door, we are not to be afraid. Why? Because Jesus not only was resurrected, He is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Friends, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And if Jesus said that if we die, we will come back to life responding to His creative words and voice, then I can assure you, friends, is going to happen. Jesus is calling His children. Jesus is calling His children today because His children today who are alive, they can hear. They can hear His voice. And Jesus said, my, 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 my sheep, they know my children, they know my voice. The only way that your dead body will be able to hear the voice of Jesus when you're dead is because your living ears, when you were alive, got so familiar to this voice, got to know so much this voice, that even when you're dead, you, rec you can recognize the divine voice of Jesus Christ. So please, friends, let us open our ears. Let us open our ears and get familiar to the voice of the Good Shepherd. Because one day, soon and very soon, you recognizing that voice will define you and your destiny. Whether you spend it eternally gone or eternally existing next to the throne to the throne of the living God. I want to invite your friends as we come to the end of this study to make a decision for Jesus because we do it now. We do it when we are alive. We do it when we're breathing. 
We're doing what we can decide when we, our brains are working, when our bodies are, can offer something. Is now when we do it, friends. And that's what I want to call you one more time, friends, to accept Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord. To accept Jesus as your substitute when you're living. Because once you're gone, there is no more opportunities. Today is the day of salvation. Today is when we listen to that voice and says, Yes, Lord, I am here and I accept you as my substitute.